Welcome to Wizards of the Tower Role Playing, R O L E P L A Y, where we're going to do everything uh, from role playing games to tabletop gaming, possibly a little computer role playing gaming. I'm Delaney. And I'm Tom. I've been gaming since 1979, long before even the Red Box that everyone talks about. Tom I'm, well, is relatively new. I am. I'm a newbie. Um, you know, if you haven't been gaming for over 20 years, and if you haven't been gaming in the Red Box uh, series or whatever, then you're considered a newbie at D&D <laughs> or Pathfinder, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just a newbie. <laughs> I would argue that, but, you know, Tom's been playing since 2006 when we yeah. uh, started gaming together. But, once again, I started playing before the Red Box. I started with the original Basic, which was the J. Eric Holmes box set, which had a wizard and a fighter facing off a dragon on a pile of uh, treasure. went from levels 1 to 3. Now let me ask you a question, Delaney. Was that a set, or was it just a book, or was it a boxed set? It was a box set, and the original box set, I can't remember what all it had. It had a, it had a rule book, like you said, levels 1 to 3. Okay. They, they had dice for a little while, but then they ran out of uh, dice, so they were using chits. So when we first started playing, we would have these little chits that were probably about, I don't know, half an inch by half an inch. And you'd cut them up, and you'd put them into a cup or a bowl, and you'd pull that out, and that was your random table instead of rolling dice. So was it just uh, pieces of cardboard that you cut up that had printed numbers on them? Yeah, or pieces of paper. Oh, okay. So you so, didn't even have dice, really. You, nope. you know, if you, if you didn't have the dice set, and of course we're going to talk about how important dice are to our games, but if you, know, you, you have to have some sort of random number you know, a way to, uh, to uh, achieve your roll, and uh, that's R-O-L-L, -L, and uh, whether you've got to use dice or chits, or even today when people use their phones, somehow you've got to come up with a random dice roll. Right, or even computers. Yeah, well, it can be automatically done. You know, with uh, what are some of those apps, those dice rolling apps that people use? I remember they were using them sometimes when we game. Well, one of the original electronic ones that I remember was a thing called a Dragon Bone, which was this cylinder thing that you push the button and it would roll dice. Now, I don't think it was that random, but it was a pretty cool thing that I looked at. But dice, you just can't beat the randomness of, of some good dice, which we'll talk in a future episode about dice and the importance of them and having some good dice. Now, when I first started gaming, when you mentioned uh, the box set, the uh, there was the Monster Manual, which came out in 77. Okay. There was the original Player's Handbook, which came out in 78, and the DMG, the Dungeon Master's Guide, which came out in 79, May of 79. So when I started playing in September of 79, the DMG was still relatively new. And then, of course, later on, we got the Deities and Demigods book in 80, the Fiend Folio in 81, which was more monsters, and then finally Unearthed Arcana in 85, which gave us Barbarians and Cavaliers and mm -hmm. a few other okay. things. Now, why did we decide to call it role-playing, R-O-L-E, instead of role-playing, R-O-L-L? Well, role-playing in general is you're, you're taking on a role of a character. You're not rolling the dice. There's been instances in our games where, you know, I don't like people always having to roll the dice to succeed in, in communicating something that's going on. Yeah, it helps. I'll give them a, a little bonus on a die if they role play really well. I enjoy really good role playing with my players. Not everybody's a great role player. So, you know, you got to kind of roll with that. <laughs> gotcha. Um, you know, one of the things we talked about when, in our games, of course, is role playing is encouraged. R O L E playing is encouraged. And that's because it really adds a lot of flavor and character to the game. Whether or not you uh, have a special kind of accent that you use, or some kind of a mannerism, or you even wear like a different hat, or some kind of an outfit, whatever, something simple, uh, it really adds flavor to a game that's already meant to be, you know, very uh, diverse and very complex. And hence, you know, we are playing role-playing games. And it's not our R-O-L-L -L playing games. Role, where we roll the dice. Yeah, where we assume the role of a character right. as we play them. Whether that be a fighter, wizard, cleric, rogue, monk, paladin, mm -hmm. barbarian, elf, dwarf, or some other unusual race or sure. character. And we decided to call ourselves Wizards of the Tower. Because, you know, that's always the... 
that's always the part that people think about when they think about role-playing games as a wizard in their tower. You know, casting magic, throwing firebolts down at people, or stuff like that. And that's what every that's what seems to always get people upset when you talk about role-playing games is wizards. You know, just like even in the Harry Potter universe, oh those wizards, you know, this you know, they're doing this and that. They've got to be evil and you know, it's like and of course everybody knows about Gandalf and and Saruman. And of course they had you know Saruman was in the tower. So we decided to go ahead and call it Wizards of the Tower because there's a tremendous amount of tradition there. No way associated with Wizards of the Coast. No, and we'll deal with that later on. We'll talk more about that, but we are not associated with any gaming company, uh, any sort of entertainment corporation or anything. We, uh, we basically exist on our own as role-playing uh, gamers. We do have our favorite system, which is Pathfinder 1st Edition, but yeah. I've played... You know, since 1979, I played first edition, second, third, 3.5, yeah. uh, jumped to Pathfinder when fourth edition came out. Mm -hmm. One one version I never played, and then I played a little bit of fifth edition. But all in all, when it comes to fantasy RPGs, I like Pathfinder. And you know, 3.5 was a great system too, and it's that's yeah. what Pathfinder is kind of roughly based off of. I haven't got to play Pathfinder second edition. There's some things I'd like to try in it, but uh, I'll, I'll do that probably with an online group. Well, uh, let's, uh, let's back up just a minute and tell everybody uh, how you got into uh, playing D&D or role-playing games. Yeah, so I was a sophomore in high school, mm -hmm. and I was in a speech class. And one of the young men who was in the class with me had uh, the D1 module, the Shrine of Tokoa, I believe it was called. It was about some fishmen. There was D1, D2, D3... And Dungeons and Dragons was was starting with the the whole satanic panic, you know. Yeah. And I'd heard about it, and I thought it was this yeah. game for these brainiac kids. And I was really into fantasy novels, you know, The Hobbit, Lord of the Rings, the Terry Brooks, Sword of Shannara, and uh, Conan, Edgar Rice Burroughs, John Carter of Mars, yeah. books like that. Uh, Mercedes Lackey, uh, Anne McCaffrey, just you know, all the great favorites. And I saw this module and I said, what is that? And he said, well, it's Dungeons and Dragons. And I said, can I look at the module? And he said, sure. So I took it and I flipped through it and was interested. And I said, so how do you play? And he's like, well, would you like to learn? And I said, yes, I would. And he's like, well, here's what you got to do. You got to have to go get the Dungeons and Dragons uh, books or basic set. So I saved up my money from lunch. And in a week's time, I had enough money to, to go buy the original basic set yeah. and came to school and we created characters and and uh, started the adventure and then I immediately went home and a young boy that I was babysitting Scott that uh, I taught him how to play and he, as far as I know he's, I think he still plays probably but that's how I I got into it and would play at lunchtime and, and any other free time I had and then once again going home and and playing with uh, you know, Scott and other neighborhood kids that uh, I found that were playing the game. Oh, that's great. That's great. I mean, just about everybody has some kind of an origin story, you know, where it relates to D&D &D or Pathfinder or role-playing games, I think. I know Tom wanted to always play, but he didn't get a chance to. Well, no, I didn't. And let me specifically say, um, I have a memory of, and and this is, this is something, is I never really read fantasy. I was big into sci-fi. And uh, big into like um, historical fiction, but I remember I, I'm from the Upper Midwest, and um, I remember spending all day uh, hiking along a riverbank, uh, really cold day, really really cold, coming back home on a Sunday afternoon, and I had a little old black and white TV. Actually, it was color, but it was a really small color TV with a screen not more than this a big. Nine inch. Yeah, mm -hmm. the old nine inch TV. And I turned it on. And they were playing on this kind of odd channel. We used to get these odd channels where you could tune them in. They were playing that part of The Hobbit, the Ralph Bakshi version of the cartoon where it showed smog flying over Lake Town. Mm -hmm. And the very close-up of the missing scale on Smog's chest and Bard taking aim with the bow and shooting. And I'll, that's all I got to see part of it because I had to go do something else or my parents were calling me. And I remember just being utterly fascinated by that. And I, you know, I had no experience with that because no one that I knew played D&D &D at that time. 
Well, uh, you know, time passed and I got into high school and I had a friend really into um, role-playing games and early computer games, very early computer games, and we were going to try to play D&D. And we tried, but for some reason, as a DM, he just didn't understand what was going on in the game. He just didn't know how to set up a scenario, and it just never really worked. And then it, it just lay dormant in me. You know, we remember, I remember watching movies like Dragon Slayer, you know, Conan and stuff, and just being fascinated by that sort of imagery. Yet my desire to play the game just lay, you know, dormant. And of course, uh, moving from the upper Midwest down to the deep South, the first thing you encounter when you do that is you run into the satanic panic situation where everyone says, you know, D&D, &D, oh, God, it's the devil. It brings, you know, Satan into children's lives and their hearts. And, and so, you know, they, people steer you away from it quickly. And so I never had any contact at all, really, with that until, gosh, it wasn't until Delaney and I started dating that uh, I, we were digging through the closet uh, at the old place where we used to live, and I found a, a box of figures, and they're really old orc figures. And I asked you about them. I said, hey, what all, what's all this from? And then you told me mm -hmm. all about, you know, the D and you had all the books. Yeah, Tom didn't know I played Dungeons and Dragons at the time. I didn't know. And then you started playing off the Dragon magazines, and then it started hitting me. It's like, oh, yes, I remember all this stuff from school. And some of the guys in high school that I went to high school with, you know, they had homemade T-shirts that showed things like a wizard with a wand and a dragon and and spells and stuff. And I remember looking at it like, what? You know, it just wasn't part of my uh, upbringing or my existence or, or my personal context. But it all started to slip into place when uh, we, you know, you had me take a look at the book and it was 3-5. Was it 3 or 3-5? Three, it was 3-5. Three, okay. And I started reading uh, the 3-5 rule book and I realized, wow, what have I been missing all this time? Right. And I introduced him into the group. Mm -hmm. And it's funny, you're talking about the t-shirts. And I just thought, it's like, wow, that harkens back to the Hellfire Club from Stranger Things. <laughs> it does. It does. <laughs> I and never knew that that, that existed oh, until yeah. Stranger Things, people having t-shirts. with. Yeah, they used to have, uh, I remember seeing these kids. Um, you know, they were what we'd call D&D &D geeks now. Um, I was not a D&D &D geek by any means. I was a heavy metal rock and roller in high school. It was always Scorpion's t-shirt, Judas Priest t-shirt, long Maiden. hair, Iron Maiden, long hair. Scruffy tore up jeans, combat boots, big belt. I was a metalhead. That's all I was, a metalhead. And, you know, we always listened to Ronnie Dio, and he always had his, his imagery and Judas Priest. Which was almost Dungeons and Dragons like at the time. Oh, totally, because uh, his Holy Diver a video that he had on MTV had him with a sword in a castle. Yep. You know, and I was, I was like, wow, cool imagery. It's like Dragon Slayer, you know? And, uh, or like Excalibur or something like that. And I was not part of that group but i remember seeing the kids with the home and we, there was a homemade there was a custom t-shirt shop at the mall and they sprayed those airbrush t-shirts and they were complex they were beautifully well done and had wizards with glowing you know casting fireballs and dragons and exploding castles and i remember just staring at those t-shirts like wow man this is pretty awesome but then again if you're not in that context with your friends it's not cool to wear something like that, you know, around your metalhead friends. So, And it's funny you bring up heavy metal because the movie Airheads, Chad, says, you know, I play Dungeons and Dragons. And I was like, yes! I love that. We're going to take a quick break from a non-sponsor. Badger Creek. Bad Badger. Bad Badger, Badger horns. horns. Find them at your favorite Renaissance Festival. The best drinking horns you'll ever find. Yeah, um... Uh, hand painted, uh, hand sanded and cleaned with a little brass ferrule around the edge so it doesn't uh, scar your lips. Sealed. And sealed and uh, with all sorts of uh, hand painted imagery. This of course is some Norse imagery right here. Then of course there's a raven with a moon behind it. Uh, Bad Badger horns, absolutely excellent horns. Uh, they um, have made several for us, and you, you, I don't think you could really find any that were, that were better than these. Yeah, like you said, found at your, some of your favorite larger Renaissance festivals. Or LARP. LARP. Or, LARP events. Uh, or LARP events. Now, of course, what we're drinking in these horns is traditional mead. And that mead uh, is from Hunter's Moon Meadery. 
uh, and they produce mead and severance, severance Colorado. You can actually find some of it online and get it shipped to some states. Yeah, and uh, you can find it in uh, liquor stores around uh, here, of course, but as Delaney said, you can have it shipped to you. Uh, it's traditional mead. This happens to be uh, Hunter's Moon Meadery Prospector Peach. They are a gold medal yeah. winner from the Miser Cup, which they is an are. international meadery. So that's what we're sipping today, folks, and enjoying that. Of course, we always say enjoy your libations responsibly and be very careful what you're doing. Now, you'll notice, too, on our table, this introductory episode, miniatures. Yeah. Miniatures in gaming, yes or no? <laughs> Absolutely, yes. And I just mentioned before that that was my introduction to gaming when we found that little box of all those orcs. Yeah. And the Games Workshop orcs, I believe they, they were. were. They were rather rough looking, uh, but you could still tell what they were. And it was really kind of interesting to see them because you would painted them and they were fairly well painted. But then I started painting some too, and yeah. we really got into it. And so that come that brings up what to do about figures and how to paint them and what to do with them. You know, and nowadays, of course, figures, uh, boy, they've gotten so complex. You don't have to just buy the kind that you want. Yeah, custom you design. can custom design them and have them made by someone with a three D printer. Right, which we actually have. So yeah, and we'll get into that in uh, future episodes with miniatures and terrain and everything else so and as far as miniatures you know I am a strong believer in miniatures I'll set this guy down here because I don't want to fall and break because it is a 3d printed mini some of them can be uh, right. fragile and my start with miniatures was I was playing in a game from a my favorite local gaming store the toy box or Thompson's hobbies where we lived Way back in, I think it was, I think it was, this was probably around 80, 81, and we were playing the C1, Hidden Shrine of Tomo, Tomocon or something like that. I can't remember quite the full name, but we were in the third room, and I was playing, I think I was playing a ranger or a fighter, and the DM was describing everything that was going on, and there was, I guess there was this little, uh, crayfish in the middle of the room and there was a helmet and a conch a big huge shell and there was mud and everything on the floor and I as a player was like I don't like the way this is looking so I said I'm backing out of the room back to the door that we came into which was offset a little ways those who know C1 uh, the hidden shrine of Tomoj Khan and all of a sudden combat broke out and first it hit the DM killed me and I'm like, wait, I wasn't in the room. And he's like, I didn't hear you. And at that point, it's like, I'm using minis in my game because yeah. that way we know where you are and you're responsible for your own mini. So if you don't like where it's at, you put it where, where you want it to be. Exactly. And, you know, of course, we you use these plot graphs or these maps and move them to their little squares so that, you know, you know each five-foot square and you move them around so you know exactly where you are. Well, are you at the door of the tower? Or are you outside the door? Or are you or are you inside the tower? And that sort of thing. At? And where you're at. Okay? And so it can make all the difference in the world whether or not, you know, when that fireball spell goes off, whether or not you get damage, half damage, or you get obliterated. So with that, we're going to end this episode of Wizards of the Tower role play. I'm Delaney. And I'm Tom. And may all your adventures be epic and keep on role playing. Thank you so much.